There is a lot of confusion out there because there are so many acronyms and um, they're used interchangeably. Um, and there are differences to some of the acronyms in our alphabet soup that we have here. Hello and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chain, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Today, we have one of our own GS1 US colleagues with us to discuss all things unique identification. Before we introduce her, though, I'd like to just kind of level set we all know today as consumers, we rely on e-commerce and this trend has escalated more than we could have ever imagined. And we rely as, as consumers on accurate product identification to ensure the product that we get is the product that we wanted. Um, Reed, I know that we had chatted about this in the past. Do you have any just thoughts on product identification and all things um, unique identification? Yeah, I mean, when we think of e-commerce, everyone thinks of quick, easy access um, to information. Uh, we think of search engine optimization. There's tons of acronyms that are thrown around there, but we don't really truly think about product identification. Uh, just a real quick story. I, when the pandemic hit, couldn't go to, you know, the gyms or, or, or really anything. So a lot of personal health equipment was purchased in home. I actually was looking for a rowing machine and I was doing all this research and I found this rowing machine that I really wanted. And I started to look for the best price and I came across one, but it was like 50% off from everything else. And these things were so hard to get. And it just, it was the right photo. It was the right description. It was the right everything. But in the back of my mind, I was like, this product is either stolen or they're going to send me something that is not, you know, what, what they're advertising. And just this weekend, I had a friend post a photo, the photo online and the photo of what he got. He was getting a log splitter. <laughs> and let's just say they didn't look anything alike. So I'm very excited for this conversation today. And Liz, um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, I, I just think that it's so very important when we start talking about product identification. Um, and I know that uh, we are very much looking forward to Michelle Covey, Vice President within our innovation and partnership teams to give us some insight and to really talk about all of this like alphabet soup. Um, and we know that there's tons of acronyms within everybody's organization. We're going to kind of give you a peek into product identification alphabet soup. And it was actually one of, we took a poll of, of some of our listeners and just said, hey, what are your questions that you have? And this was the top one. Like, what do all these terms mean? GTIN. UPC, EAN codes, all of this stuff. So I guess with that, Michelle, welcome to our podcast. We're really excited to have you and to hear about all of your um, insight and expertise on this subject. Well, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Reed. I'm very excited to be here today, too. And I mean, there is a lot of confusion out there because there are so many acronyms and um, they're used interchangeably. Um, and there are differences to some of the acronyms in our alphabet soup that we have here at GS1. So um, I'm glad to hopefully um, clarify and provide a little bit more insight on that. So um, I think one of the first, like you said, the first um, question is, what is the difference between like a G10, a UPC, an EAN, barcode, all those fun things? But let's start with G10s um, and what those are. Um, a GTIN stands for a global trade item number. And really that is the unique um, string of numbers that help um, a brand manufacturer um, assign, their, uh, assign to their product to be basically tracked through the supply chain. Um, it's kind of like the product's license plate. And uh, I think that's a, a good way to, you know, a good analogy for the GTIN. Um, there are a family of data structures under that global trade item number or that GTIN. Um, and that's where I think some of the confusion comes in because a UPC and an EAN 
are part of those family data structures. So there is a 12-digit G10, which is the UPC-12, and that really is, um, you know, what has been commonly used in the U.S. market to um, assign numbers, those unique um, identifier numbers to a product. Um, and then in everywhere else, pretty much in the, on the globe, um, is the EAN, the European article number. That is a 13-digit G10 or the EAN 13. And th that is um, really the identifier for um you know, that is used outside of the U.S. market. So think of it as a, a UPC-12 and an EAN-13 are both types of G10s. Those are um, data structures of G10s within the, the family of G10s. Um, there are a couple others. I'm not going to go into those. That's like, um, you know, alphabet soup, you know, 202 lesson. <laughs> so, so, Michelle, you use the analogy of uh, a license plate and we know that license plates in the United States look different than license plates in, you know, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in essence, what you're saying here is an, an EAN and a UPC, they're the same thing. They're just working interchangeably, but they're, they're one's a European version and one's an American version. Is that fair to say? Essentially, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the good analogy, but they're all um, unique identifiers, and you won't find um, a, a, a same UPC or EAN on any other product, like any other product. So it's definitely a unique number that is um, globally recognized if, um, in the following the GS1 standards. Right. So, so mm -hmm. you won't have the same license plate number in the US and then have that same license plate number in uh, the UK, for example. Exactly. Essentially. So that okay. unique license plate number right. would really eliminate the ability for having counterfeit products. Is that right? Uh, it is a tool, is a useful tool. So if a if a G10 um, and it's authorized, is like issued from a GS1 source, um, is assigned to a product, then that G10 is actually also um, associated to the company who licenses it. And we record that in our GS1 database. And then um, brands or retailers can look it up and ensure that that, that G10 is associated to that company. So that is a, a great tool for um, helping to, you know, check for counterfeit or ensure that a product is authentic and, and is um, associated to that brand owner. Yeah, it's that, it's that authenticity. I think that's important to a lot of our listeners is they want to make sure that they're being represented. So let's talk a little bit then about, you know, the UPC and the EAN both have a G10 number assigned to them. Is that fair to say? They are. They are essentially G10s. They are. Yes. Um, it's a it's a data structure of a G10. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So, where can I get these G10s? Because um, we have folks ask that to us all the time. Like, can I buy it anywhere? Can I get it issued from anyone? Um, where can I get the G10 from? So ideally, GS1 has, um, has the, I guess, the global standard um, of G10 uh, assignment. So um, a lot of different GS1 member organizations, or there are a lot of different GS1 member organizations around the globe that license these uh, G10s. Uh, GS1 US here serves the US market. So brands and manufacturers can come to GS1 US and license their G10, um, and we will be the issuer, and it will be recorded in that GS1 database. There are other um, offerings out there. Um, they are not, if they're not issued by a GS1 member organization, then they are usually not authentic GS1 barcodes, though they may um, represent themselves that way. But um, being a not-for-profit um, member-driven organization, GS1 um, is the only true issuing agency of GS1 G10s. So I'm going to go back to the license plate analogy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have uh, older siblings and I got hand-me-down cars, as we all have, and very, very thankful for them. But in essence here, what, what's happening is, is like when you get a license plate from the DMV, it, it says this is a license plate and this is the car it's registered to. And this is the owner of that car that it's registered to. 
So if one of my siblings gives me a license plate off of their car and says, hey, go ahead, put this on your car, go drive around town, I can do that. But when I get pulled over, the police are going to say, huh, your license plate says this is for uh, a Toyota Camry, but you're driving a, a Ford pickup truck. It also says that your Toyota Camry is from 2018, but this pickup truck is from 1972. <laughs> they don't they don't line up. That's, you know, when you talk about GS1 member organizations and GS1 US, we're one of those member organizations and there's GS1 Canada and there's GS1 Germany and, and so on to, to represent the countries, um, you know, around the globe. But that's what you're saying. It's being issued from these organizations. Otherwise, yeah, it, it's, it's a real G10 that you're getting, but it's going to represent somebody else's product and somebody else's company. Right. So the the DMV, consider us in that example, GS1 as the DMV. We are the authentic issuers of that license plate. So don't get a, your license plate from your brother or your sister or your cousin. <laughs> get it from uh, from GS1. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I, we have a lot of other questions here from our listeners. So let's move on to number two, which is, is very closely related to this. Um, and you even mentioned it in your in your aspect. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are familiar with a barcode, um, and some folks even refer to GS1 as the barcode company. Oh, they're the barcode company. Go, go get a barcode from them. But there's more to it. Not all barcodes are created equal, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's different types of barcodes. And you even said it, like the UPC being a barcode. So can, can you dive into this for us, and can you kind of peel back the layers on this uh, to clear up some um, some blurriness that folks have. Sure. And I know, uh, you know, here at GS1 US, I do it too. I use them interchangeably, but there is a huge difference. So like, like I said, barcodes, UPCs, GTINs, EANs, a lot of times people will associate them all as one exact, like the same thing, but there is actually a distinct difference. So I, I kind of explained that a GTIN is uh, that global trade item number, and there is a family of data structures. Those are the, the numbers. Um, a barcode is actually the data carrier that captures that information so that a um, it goes from a human readable string of numbers to a machine readable string. Um, so that that barcode is really the linear representation of the G10. Um, and it's the thing that makes the little beep at the checkout counter when you go to the grocery store and your you know can of green beans goes across the checkout stand, uh, those those little black and white lines. So it's really the barcode is is really the data carrier that allows um, that global trade item number to be read. Um, and there are other data. There are other barcodes out there. Um, we support. At, from GS1 standards perspective, there are several different barcodes that are used um, for different uses. We have the, the GS1 data matrix, which is being used in the um, healthcare industry. Um, there are many different types of barcodes, but you know, to your point, the UPC barcode is the one that most of us are commonly used to seeing on our products that go beep at the checkout counter. So it's like saying Kleenex or Xerox. It's just mm -hmm. yeah, such popularity. It's it's not being specific. It's just kind of generalizing it when people use it that way. Yeah, exactly. But there is a difference between the barcode and a GTIN. So the GTIN is the number. The barcode is the data carrier that carries that GTIN so that a machine. So everybody it. should should pick up awesome. whatever's sitting on their on their desk or in their kitchen and take a look at that because you know, when you can see it and pick it up and look at those lines and the number under it, I think that will bring a lot more clarity as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's important also to call out because um, I've been in these conversations where it's like, Oh, you're the barcode people. I'm like, well, yes, we're, we're very well known for the barcode, specifically the UPC universal product code. Um, but we also are, you know, data carrier agnostic. So we work with barcodes. We work with, 2D and, uh, and 1D barcodes. We work with RFID, um, you know, because you can have you can have a GTIN in a QR code. You can have a GTIN in an RFID tag. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not overstating anything there, am I? 
You're, you're absolutely and actually, correct. Reed, it's very strange that you just said that because the next question that we got is a little bit related to that, the various barcodes and how the barcode is evolving. So we know that that, that 1D barcode that everybody sees at point of sale has been around for a very long time. But Michelle, we're seeing barcodes, we're seeing products with those barcodes, but also the QR code. Why, why would there be two barcodes on that? What do you see coming um, in, that, in that arena? Well, I, and I think this is where uh, it's really exciting. You know, as, as we've been using this barcode for um, over 40 years, you know, like anything, uh, the barcode is evolving. And I think it's really coming from us as consumers. We are demanding more and more information about our products. You know, I don't know about you guys, but when I pick up my, you know, food at a grocery store, I want to know what is the nutritional information in it? Are there allergens? You know, where did it come from? Um, the linear barcode that we've been used to only carries a very limited set of data, pretty much just the G10 so that it could be associated to price lookup in a, in a retailer's backend system. But now with all of us having little machines in our pockets, basically our smartphones, you know, we've got um, a lot of capability with our camera to scan barcodes and pull up and look up a lot of product information. And so that's where I think the bar barcode, and it's really exciting, I think this is where the barcode is starting to evolve. That linear barcode that we see on our products today really doesn't carry all that inf that much information. But as we move to 2D barcodes, like QR codes, so much more information can be um, carried in there and it can all be read with our smartphones. So what we're seeing is a movement um, and GS1 actually worked with industry members um, to create the GS1 digital link standard, which allows for um, you know that resolver to have that G10 point to a bunch of information. So you could have nutritional information. You can ha pull up uh, traceability information about your product. Where did my lettuce come from? Which farmer grew it and where did it go through the supply chain? It's very handy for recalls too. Um, what was my garment made of? Um, what are some on my products? What are war What is the warranty information? What are you know instruction manuals? So much more can be carried on those um, within those two D barcodes. And I really do believe, and we're helping industry members move that way to to move to the two D barcode, just because it's so much more powerful and consumers are demanding it. And I think we're going to see some regulations that are going to drive it too, where we just need to provide so much more information about a product um, and its provenance and, uh, you know, information that might be for consumer safety. Um, you know, it just helps evolve, you know, products from 40 years ago into today's um, time where we're also, you know, information driven. Yeah, and, and we're seeing that in some industries too, right? Like healthcare has already moved to the 2D barcode in, in some specific use cases. And we're also seeing the adoption of 2D barcodes in a lot of other countries outside of the U.S. that are adopting it for a lot of different uses. So piece of the G10 versus like the barcode and the data carrier, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, the G10 is kind of, it's that identifier. And once you have it, it's with you, you have it and you can use it multiple ways. You can even use it multiple ways on the same product where mm -hmm. maybe that, that G10 is used once in the barcode, a second time in a 2D barcode and a third time on an RFID tag um, for different reasons along the supply chain. It, it seems simple and easy, but as Liz and I have talked about in previous podcasts, the supply chain is not a single loop and it's not a single line. Supply chain is a web. Yeah, no, actually, and you touched on it because when Michelle talked about those handoffs of data, the cross-reference table that all of these organizations are having to maintain in a manual way, because not everyone within the supply chain has that globally unique, globally recognized number. And if they did, think about the errors that could potentially be eliminated and read to your point how much more quickly products can get into a market um, to be sold. So it's, it, that was the example, just 
all of those numbers and how much more mm-hmm. easy um, it would be if it was that one number for everybody. And it allows for, um, you know, if I'm a retailer and one of my warehouses is out of product, but I do know same if it has a globally unique ID, um, but I see it in another warehouse or in a store that is closer to the consumer for me to pivot really quickly and get that product to the consumer. So um, it just helps tie all of your product information together in a single view um, and track it again through the global supply chain. I think sometimes we're called the global language of business, but it's true. We can help businesses track that product globally through the whole supply chain um, and uh, be interoperable so that, you know, you could see the whole trade-off everywhere around the globe. Yeah. Google did a study um, and I forget when I saw it, but it was this year, but this year, 20, it's Mm -hmm. been a blur with everything, but they said reference to something of the effect of, it was like roughly a 20% increase in online sales. If it had a global trade item number, because they could go look that up. So like you just said, you ran out of it here. I want to go someplace else and look for it. I want to make sure it's the same product from the same manufacturer back to my original uh, examples of looking for a rowing machine or my friend that got the log splitter and they, they were advertised the same way, but they, they didn't show the global trade item number, um, you know, in it. Liz, I think you have the next question from, I do. Uh, from our and listeners. It actually has to do with small business because we know that um, during the pandemic, There was tons of small businesses being created, and we just heard that that folks would like to know how we how we as an organization and you as a leader um, took that back and helped helped us kind of adapt from a larger focus of business to a smaller business focus. Yeah, well, I think um, with the pandemic, um, many people were stuck at home. Um, and they had a lot of time on their hands or had more time on their hands, maybe. And so we saw some uh, great innovation coming out of our small business growth. Um, We saw a lot of new products being launched, a lot of new businesses being launched. Um, And I think we also, some of these businesses realized they might have been selling into maybe their local stores and with a lot of places being shut down, they had to pivot really quickly and try to start selling their products online. So um, there was a shift and some of these uh, businesses may not have because their small product lines didn't and selling locally didn't have G tins on their products, um, and they had to shift so that they could represent themselves on these you know massive e commerce platforms or sell them into uh, retail channels that do require unique identification. So um, you know we just started seeing a lot of these small businesses you know pivot and start to sell online, and with that they um, you know came to GS One because a lot of those online. Um, e-commerce platforms do um, necessitate a GTIN for that product identity. So, um, you know, we've also seen this shift in small businesses coming um, growth within GS, our GS1 member community and realize that, um, you know, we want to make it easier for them to do business. We don't want to be a hindrance. We want them to come to us, get the, a, a GS1 issue GTIN so that they could, you know, sell on these marketplaces and, and, um, you know, do business right next to some of our large brands that have been doing um, business for many, many years. So as we looked at how we service our members, uh, GS1 came up with um, a, a single G10 offering, whereas in the past, if anybody's been familiar with our business model, we provided uh, G10s more in bundles. Um, so a, a brand would come to us and get a bundle of a thousand G tins or a ten thousand or a hundred thousand. Um, we really wanted to meet the needs of those small businesses and those micro small businesses. So uh, we helped um, do that by, you know, introducing a single G tin. So that you know, if I'm a, a small business owner, I you know decided to start launching a new product in my garage over the, the during the pandemic. I could come to GS1 and get a one, two, three G tins. Pretty easy. They're already pre-constructed and 
ready to be uh, used in market and uh, relatively low fee structure at $30 per G10 and no renewal, renewable, no annual renewal. So um, I think we made it pretty easy for small businesses to, to assign GS1 um, issue G10s to their products through our GS1 US um, store. And hopefully that helps some of these small businesses get online quicker and uh, be able to, to trade with those retail trading partners and those e-commerce platforms that they uh, you know, hadn't done so in the past. Michelle, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, with the startups I met with last week, a lot of them had advisors from larger, well-known household name retail organizations, um, and they were getting advice, which was correct advice on pursuing a G10 to create their UPCs and, and to get involved, but they were unaware of the um, single G10 offering because uh, most most of them were told the smallest amount you could have was 100, but we only have one or two products. Um, and then some knew, oh, no, 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 you can get them in, in batches of 10 because um, that was the smallest prior to um, where we're at. But the world has changed. The world has changed a lot. And so now it's, it's great to know that you can just get them one at a time and have a perpetual mm -hmm. license for that, yeah. too, which is really cool. So, OK, um, I have another question here from from our listeners. When someone's trying to grow an e-commerce platform like on Amazon or Shopify, what is it about product identification that you try and reinforce with these folks? So some of it we've touched on um, already, but I'm going to highlight there's I, I think there's kind of three main uh, pieces of advice that I would give um, a business or a small business trying to 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 gain some traction on an e-commerce e platform. Um, I think first off, and, and we started it, uh, started the conversation about GTINs, but you have to start off with um, building that credibility with your trading partners or your retailers by proving that your product is an authentic product and it's assigned to you. And that usually, of course, is is with assigning a G10 to your product. Um, many of these large uh, e-commerce platforms do use the GS1 database to uh, check the authenticity of that G10 and make sure that it's associated to the brand owner. And so, again, having those products uniquely identified with a GS1 issued G10, you know, that retailer will have confidence that your product is, is really set up for success. So that is like my first um, piece of advice. Um, second is, you know, as you are starting to build your product and product and talk about product launch, you know, plan for growth. So a lot of what we've seen is a lot of these small businesses have come, uh, wanted to start selling on uh, these e-commerce platforms because it's an easy way to start their business. Um, and we kind of touched on this before, but if you didn't take heed to my first piece of advice, they may have assigned a, a, a product identifier to their product, but they may have not got that from a GS1 source. And what will, what they'll find out is maybe some, some e-commerce platforms will take that um, non uh, GS1 issued G10 um, and accept it for a product listing. But then that product gains some great success and other retailers want to start selling it. Well, those retailers will then require a G10 or ask for a G10 on the product. And you now end up ha in a situation where you assigned a product identifier initially, but now this new, you're, you're growing your business. Now this new retailer wants to have um, a G10. You have to go back and repackage, relabel, um, come to GS1, get a G10 from us. So you're almost paying um, double. So you really, again, it, kind of the first two go hand in hand is understand what are your growth plans and where do you want to sell your product and, and on which channels and, you know, who are your ideal uh, retailers down the line and, and understand their um, business requirements and set yourself up for success early by, by just, you know, getting those product identifiers set up um, early. And then third is, and I think we touched on this too, is, you know, your rowboat um, or your rowing machine example is, you know, having that G10 um, allows your product to um, increase in um, searchability across the web. So again, you know, you want your product to have a lot of presence 
um, online. So we call it the, the physical shelf versus the digital shelf. So you want to match, have that digital shelf representation of your product to be very much like the physical shelf. You want to make sure that product attributes and images and all of that product content associated to your, your um, product are um, an accurate description so that when a consumer is looking for your product and they find it online, and it comes up in a search engine um, result because you looked up, um, you know, a blue T-shirt. It has all of the um, identifying uh, product attributes so that um, I can make a, a good buying decision as a consumer uh, about that product because I can't feel it. I can't touch it. I have to, you know, rely on the information online. And so having good um, product information, um, good images um, will help. And then having that G10 associated um, allows for all of that product information to be shared, especially if you're um, selling across multiple uh, selling channels then it would, you know, come together in a search engine um, optimization where consumers could then make choices on which retailer to choose it from and have um, all of that great information. And, you know, maybe one retailer might have a coupon and you might want to go to that retailer versus another, but it's all tied together um, using, you know, a G10 to, to help you find it, um, a consumer find it online. So I guess those are my, 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 core main um, set of advice. Uh, I'm sure I have others, but that's, that's my first set. It's great information. Yeah. It, it's a lot, right? Um, <laughs> how to be successful at this takes a lot of time and energy and research and just data quality is so very important. And then you layer in that unique identification. Mm -hmm. um, so this has been, this has been amazing. And I know we're running out of time. This last question is not necessarily one that our members put, but it's kind of a smurge of what we, we typically ask um, our guests on the podcast. So what is something that really blew your mind in the past two years? So was it like an innovation? Was it a technology? Was it something that came out of the disruption that really kind of has stuck with you this whole time? Um, well, there's a lot of things that have blown my mind over the last <laughs> few years, personally. But um, I think, you know, really, it's been very interesting to see how um, businesses have been um, able to pivot and be innovative during the last couple of years. Um, I think if if companies and businesses weren't able to change and adapt, um, we may they may not be. Um, around right now. Um, but we've also seen um, just some fantastic case studies and stories of um, some of our brands being able to, to pivot one to just change their product offerings to, to suit the needs of, of just the environment the last couple of years. You know, uh, we saw stories of, you know, garment manufacturers switching to make uh, face masks and, and you know, um, protective gear for frontline workers. We've seen alcohol distilleries shift their business to make hand sanitizer products just to help, you know, serve, you know, what was going on during the pandemic. So, you know, just being innovative with products and being able to shift, but also um, being innovative the way they sell. Um, and our technology providers also being able to help those brands. So being able to help these these businesses pivot from maybe a, a purely physical selling um, environment to a digital and having the support needed and the, the new tools and the ability to get brands moved online quickly. Um, I think just it was it was a lot of effort by not just the brands, but also our technology partners that do um, that work with um, GS1 US. So just just how everybody came together too was really nice. Um, I think with all of the disrupt disruption, there was a lot of change, but I think uh, that change is here for good. It's not um, like we're going to go back to where we were pre-pandemic. I think this is now our new normal and we're going to be always looking at innovative ways to, to bring products to market and to adapt to the changing and evolving needs of, of our industry. Yeah, well, Michelle, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us here today um, and these in-depth answers to a lot of our listeners' questions. Uh, found it really insightful, and and, and I, I hope that our listeners have as well. Liz, any last words before we wrap it up today? 
No, Michelle, thank you so much. I think that, you know, just your level setting, what the G10 and, and the UPC and the barcode and, and how the QR code can work in the future just has been really great. And talking about that, that global unique identifier and what it can do to help really supply chains be consistent and resilient is was just awesome. So thank you so much. Of course. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. And for our listeners, remember, a G10 is a global trade item number. It's what makes up a UPC. The UPC is that common 1D barcode, but not all barcodes are UPCs. And in Europe, they call it an EAN. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you for joining the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1US. If you enjoyed today's show, you can subscribe to our feed or explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again.